Welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead webinar series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and we're really delighted to bring yet another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Our Women Lead webinars are designed for you, the professional leader in business, whether that means you're an aspiring woman leader, or a woman leading people, or projects, teams, or a company or business, we select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. Now, our webinar is just shy of one hour, and we'll be answering any questions that you've submitted online during the presentation portion of our webinar. So as we go through this, any questions that you might have or insights or comments that you want to share, just put them in the chat box, and then I will share those with our presenters at near the end of the webinar. Now, the focus of our webinar today is, who is that guy? And the subtitle is Women Leaders Finding Superpowers and Leveraging Male Allies. And I'm really excited to introduce our thought leaders today. We have two of them together. We have Abigail and Knight, who are joining us from Cairn Leadership Strategies. And I want to tell you just a little bit about um, Cairn Leadership. Uh, these guys are like nobody I've ever interviewed on a webinar before. So to say I'm just a tad bit intimidated would be the understatement of the year. But um, I went on their website and was looking at some of the things that they do. And the logo that you see on the screen right now, Karen Leadership, is uh, a, a stack of rocks. And on their website, it told what that actually means. And these are markers. They're, um, directional milestones, if you will, that guide people when they maybe get lost in, in the wilderness or get lost in the snow or just, you know, lose their way along the way. And these are put there by people who have walked this way before. So I just love that. And especially with the way things are in business, often we are so busy doing the business or doing our job that we lose track, lose sight of why we're actually doing it. So without any further ado, um, these guys will tell their story far more eloquently than I can. So I'm going to turn it over to Knight and Abigail and take it away, you guys. It's all yours. You're that guy. Hi, the guy I saw on my LinkedIn feed who leads leadership development events using Outdoor Adventure. Aren't you the one with the company who guides women's specific events? I am. I'm a co-founder of Karen Leadership and we develop leaders through Outdoor Adventure and we also do a lot of women's specific events. Okay, that's interesting. But you know, I've really got to ask, who do you think you are leading women's specific events? Don't you think you should stay in your lane and leave that work to the actual women leaders in San Diego? Uh, I, I guess I was hoping for more support. I mean, obviously I recognize I have a little bias as a man in this space. Uh, and I know the value of women helping women. And I don't even pretend to know what it's like to lead a woman. So my expertise is in leadership. Okay, great. But how does that help? We don't need leadership experts. We need women-specific experts in leadership. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I have a real motivation for investing in the empowerment of women because I'm raising a 16-month-old daughter, and I feel like I've come a long way on my view on women in leadership. I mean, I've been pretty lucky to have two commanding officers in the Navy who are outstanding leaders and women. I'm actually married to a former Marine and almost orthopedic surgeon. So I feel like I have a little bit of insight here. Okay, I'm glad you, you figured it out. So tell me, what is the value of women in power? Well, here's the bottom line. After being in this space for a long time and talking to a lot of people, I don't think it's a problem that men or women can solve alone. Right now, overall, men are kind of in a power position, and that makes it hard for me to see the perspective that women have, and frankly, it's hard to give up power. We all need to be part of this conversation, as sticky and uncomfortable as it can be. So you're big on diversity and inclusion, then? A champion of women? Oh, I can't stand that champion idea. It's very medieval. I'm sure not against diversity, 
And melting perspectives together makes teams perform better, provided that they're well managed. That said, I'm not a justice, social justice warrior. Karen Leadership is about helping leaders and organizations thrive. We're not really attacking this from the fairness perspective, which is important. Rather, we're looking at this from maximizing organizational and societal effectiveness. Men in power simply aren't tapping into women's authentic strengths and contributions. That's a hard thing for me to see and to say from a privileged position, but I know we need to do the work to empower women because teams of women and men outperform single gender teams. I like what you're saying here. Uh, if we need to solve this problem together though, then why do you do women specific events? Well, you're right. Ideally, we don't separate. That's part of the problem after all. But women bring the most to the table when they're authentic. And this needs and requires psychological safety. A great example is when I teach women-specific REI climbing classes. The feeling is just completely different. Women open up and, and they support each other and they find their best selves. It just doesn't happen in a mixed gender class. I see that. Women I know do show up as their full selves when it is all women. And personally, I find it hard to be myself at work when I'm treated as the token woman in the group. But I also understand the danger of a single gender conversation. I mean, that separation is one of the main factors that has brought disempowerment to women in the first place. It's true. Closing the gender gap is the right thing to do. And companies that do it, I think, are going to outperform others. Consider the business sense it makes to diversify boards of directors. Women bring some unique strengths to business, and studies have shown businesses with women on their boards outperform homogeneous boards, particularly in economic challenges. One study showed that women, boards with women on them outperformed others by 26%. Why are we leaving that on the table? It's also important to note that just having one woman on the board isn't that effective. It's better to have 50-50 split. Let's get even bigger, though. Studies show we lose $2 trillion a year in U.S. GDP and $12 trillion globally through gender inequality. Not only does it make business sense, it's also the right thing to do. But how are you, a man, going to help me develop leadership skills? All the male mentors I've had in the past end up giving me advice like, you're too emotional, or you're not decisive, or you seek too much consensus. Mm -hmm. Or in the worst case, I've even had a potential mentor tell me he's attracted to me. I'm done believing that male mentors can truly be a service to, service to leader, leaders' issues that are about women. I'm not going to lie. As a man, it feels a little ridiculous and maybe even disrespectful to talk to women about gender and leadership. I encourage you to take everything I say with a grain of salt. And as always, if I'm way off base on something, I'll buy anyone a cup of coffee and listen to their perspective on the issue. Hmm, I do like coffee. All right, keep going. Okay, here's one point on why I should be in the conversation. As a leadership coach, I'm very aware of how hard it is for leaders to notice blind spots, and I often see surprising behaviors, even from the most informed women leaders. Some examples that I see are women apologizing to everyone in women's events. I see high power women uh, affirming that women are simply better than men at taking notes. I hear women in public addresses using terms like guys or manning the front desk often. And often I, I sit in with women specific events and I'm the only man at a table and when someone poses a question, everybody defers to me as the man to answer the question first. Usually an outside perspective helps leaders gain clarity, and it isn't different here. If we want to move forward as a society, men and women need to co-create the solution. Yeah, I just try to ignore these things. My day would honestly be miserable if I paid attention to all the subtle bias and misogyny stacked against me. To be honest, I'm already dismissing that you could possibly know what it's like for me or what's best for me. Yeah, I respect that. And I can imagine that many women share your sentiment of, why can't this just go away? All I can really do is listen and offer my perspective. Okay, listen then. I refuse to lead like a man. I like to focus on excellent work over networking and influence, and I want to prioritize my family and children. I want, to, I want space to speak up in meetings without getting shut down or having my ideas repeated and stolen by men in the room. 
It's exhausting to try to act like male leaders think I should act. And I use up all my energy doing that instead of doing good work for my people and my organization. You are so right. And imagine all of that energy funneled into moving forward. Teams like that are unstoppable. That's the whole point of caring leadership, joining the conversation and offering women specific programs. Plus, it seems like men value sacrificing everything else for careers. I refuse to compromise here. I won't sacrifice my family or what I firmly believe in to walk over others on my path to greatness like I've seen so many men do. Whoa. As a part-time stay-at-home dad, I take a little offense at that, but I see your point. I hear a lot of frustration there, and I simply don't experience that as a man. I know when I'm assertive, people value my leadership, but I hear people say you're bossy. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There are real societal pressures at play that I find even the best intentioned men and women in power I know under past. For in instance, there's this success likability penalty where before I even enter a room, my name as a woman puts me at a disadvantage. As that study by Columbia University found with the Heidi versus Howard resume experience. And then there's that office housework bias and the big one maternal bias false assumptions about expectations do real harm in limiting potential when women decide to bear children men leaders can become advocates here to offer career advancement opportunities and demonstrate forward-thinking assumptions that women can and will perform better in the workplace even while raising a family i know it's a real struggle i often watch my wife with our daughter while she's in medical school and I give up opportunities to stay at home to take care of our See? little- See? That's what I'm saying. You just interrupted me and made it about you in one sentence. Let me continue. There's even more to this. There's a performance attribution bias where leaders explain the causes for a problem on a person and fail to consider the whole situation. I just think leaders have a responsibility to understand the complexities of a situation and recognize the impulse to jump to conclusions rather than slow down an extra second to see the extra constraints at play for women. We see this particularly affecting women of color. Whoa, I apologize for interrupting. It's just happened, I guess. I'm a little worried I'm gonna offend you with anything I say now. Well, get over it. This happens all the time. Men say they wanna help, and then when we push back, you go into a shell. Oh, you're right. I'm all ears. How can we create a solution here? I wish I had a solution. Well, here's what I know. After years of study and master's degrees and experience teaching women and rock climbing and, and our own women-specific leadership events, you know, psychological safety is the number one contributing factor to creating and sustaining high-performing teams. It builds trust, the foundation for everything else. We have to have these tough conversations in positive ways. Hmm. This conversation doesn't feel like one I'd feel safe having with most men. The world is so polarized right now. I just don't want to engage. Exactly. We have to continue to find ways to talk this through without getting defensive. Dialogue over debate. In fact, we're going to start Campfire Dialogues at Karen Leadership next month as a forum for these kinds of conversations. Our first one is April 23rd at La Jolla Shores. And the topic, sex and leadership. It's free for people who want to join forces on tough topics. I like that. Create a structured space to have important conversations with psychological safety before you get into the emotionally charged conversations. Yes. I guess we should try that next time. Also, you know, this takes patience. We know from bias training that people don't suddenly become unbiased. It takes years of wrestling in small and big ways. Having a container for high performers to have tough conversations, especially mixed gender ones. Yes. The key initially is to lay ground rules for mutual respect, empathetic listening, and action-oriented outcomes. Change is going to take some fierce conversations, some dialogue, and some openness to feeling hurt on both sides. I think it's about time we level the playing field. Wait. One thing I've come to know, a level playing field doesn't exist. Sameness limits everyone's strength rather than helping us. A great example in my mind is rock climbing. Men tend to be good at rock climbing because they're explosive, powerful, strong, aggressive. And women are as good or better because they're strategic, poised, balanced. They use core strength and tension and actually use their legs. Good technique. 
Telling women to lead like men discounts the unique talents and strengths that women bring to the table. And considering the fact that women influence 83% of purchase decisions in the U.S., and yet only 25 of the 500 Fortune 500 CEOs are women, and only about 34% of corporate boards have women on them, I know men in leadership have a lot to learn. That's what I'm saying. When women aren't able to bring different fundamental strengths to bear, my team, my organizations, my communities at large are missing a huge opportunity. And I often get shut down for making decisions using intuition because it doesn't feel right isn't enough. But when you look at gender effects on risk taking, women like me have a pragmatic approach to risk that keeps my teams feeling safe and performing successfully. From the check-ins I insist on at the start of every meeting to the increased pay I approve to keep teams families thriving. How can I communicate that to the CEO of my company? I wish I had an answer. I'm a fast mover and I like to make decisions quickly, so it's really hard for me to slow down and talk through things. Sure, I can say I will, but in the heat of the moment, I often diminish what others are thinking by moving too fast. Also, it turns out men are just default to risky when we're stressed out. That doesn't seem so good. Seems like we should make this more balanced. We can create systems that allow everyone to be hurt. It takes having structured processes that require everyone to speak in meetings and make everyone take a turn as meeting scribe. We need to demand diversity from executive recruiters so they focus on qualifications instead of subjective measures for hiring as a start. Those are great points. This is a place where systems would help a lot. By the way, you should value your intuition. It's just an accumulation of experience and observations. Maybe you can't put words to your reasons right away, but I bet some reflection will generate well thought out logic and reasoning. On the flip side, ensure the process demands that the men in the group explain our facts too. We're often basing decisions on intuition as well, though we might not admit it. Hindsight bias and backfilling are very real. That is helpful. I can recall a few times when my focus on the bigger purpose has led me to make a decision that helps my organization survive. Still, when the call is mine to take, I've often got feedback such as, you stayed too calm. Or on the flip side, when I do make a risky, quick decision, I've been told to tone it down. I swear, if I show any emotion, it feels like men are going to hand me a tissue box. I feel like I'm on a tightrope and all the time teetering between emotional and passionate, stone cold or crier. So annoying. Yeah, often men just don't know how to or flat out don't want to deal with emotions, period. Men suppress emotion are rarely self-aware enough, so we put you on a tightrope just so you can't win. Good news is science shows women have a head start on emotional intelligence. In the workplace, look for men who have emotional intelligence or a high level of self-awareness. You can spot them over time because they allow their and other people's emotions to surface. And here's the fact, leaders need to be emotional. Emotion creates trust and passion is what millennials work for. The nine to five punch in, punch out factory job is dead. High end jobs, jobs are gonna expand as AI takes over the non-emotional realm. Yeah, knowing when to leave is a conversation I have with many of my professional women friends. We should not have to lean in to get promoted or paid equally. And frankly, many of us are in fact not leaning in with, with the way it's traditionally been done with aggressive leadership behavior to rise to the ranks because we are too busy doing excellent work. I agree. We often take your work for granted until you leave. Maybe a system that helps highlight everyone's work without putting the burden on the employee to showcase their value would help. I used to think women were being bossy because sometimes you have this super annoyed tone. Then I realized I just didn't hear what you said the first five times. If I had to repeat myself five times, I guess I'd be irritated too. I think we need to figure out how to tamp down our egos and listen better more than women need to lean in. Ugh, the fearless male leader paradigm. I wish more men recognize the power of building community and consensus as strong leadership. I seriously think organizations that can't do that are doomed. Especially with younger generations, the great man theory of leadership is over. And women often have this superpower of listening that strengthens bonds. Unfortunately, biologically, noticing other people's body and emotional cues is much harder in a high status role. That's really interesting. I wonder if we could create routines and rituals to celebrate active listening organizations, like 
paraphrasing ideas and building on them instead of just stealing the woman's idea and moving on like it was my own. Yeah. It's also interesting that the research shows that when men are subordinate to women, they are way more emotionally intelligent almost immediately upon taking that lower status role. So emotional intelligence is actually an output of historical disempowerment. So how do you suggest that I lead more like a woman, more like me? Well, one of the most helpful books I've read on this subject is The Confidence Code. The authors say, think less, take action, and be authentic. That's the key to me. Authentic leadership. Easy to say, I know. But explaining why you approach leading your, in your authentic style helps. Also, time and solitude to really drill down what authentic leadership style looks like is invaluable. That's why we go outside so much with care and leadership. It also helps to seek out a diverse group of mentors. The authors of Athena Rising talk about the power of a woman having a male mentor. Get a great male mentor, find someone that makes sense, and don't wait for the offer, ask. Finally, think about what leading as a woman ideally could look like rather than what it looks like now. In specific situations when you don't have the authority to immediately make a decision, you could ask yourself, what would the feminine approach look like? And start working toward that. It seems a little bit like a lean in to lead out is appropriate. Unfortunately, you might end up playing the game a little, but ultimately moving past this is the goal. Yeah, for me, I know I am authentically leading when I am comfortable and energized. I think a key leadership trait here is humility. We've cast that aside as a society, thinking it denotes weakness. But great leaders understand it's not all about them. I love Guy Raz ask everyone on how I built this, if it was luck or hard work that helped them build billion dollar companies, and every one of them says it was a mix. Society keeps telling women to lean in and stop saying it was their team or they were lucky. But instead, maybe we should tell men to lean out, and start acknowledging the role of others and luck in their success. I think you hit a home run with that one. I will be the best leader when I'm making decisions with my heart, when I relate with my team with radical transparency to build real connections. That's when I'm most effective and when I feel the most true to the real me. Okay, so how do we wrap this up? What should we do to be part of the solution? Well, in your culture, you can commit to calling out biases and societal artifacts when you see them and promote regular tough conversations about this topic before people are emotionally engaged. I think maybe people could recognize, record, and communicate the benefits of women leading authentically in their organizations. And create process and structure to enable full engagement from the whole team, such as rotating note-taking and meetings, making interviews about objective data and skills rather than locker room talk and not using names on resumes period in the hiring process. Thank you all so much for joining us on this webinar today. We're honored to be here and especially excited about what we're learning and building together. Our company care and leadership is uniquely suited to offer leadership development because of our differences that make us a stronger team with the capacities of both male and female perspectives. This conversation is hard and frankly it was difficult and often contentious for us to put this together and it's the only way we're going to move forward. Together Knight and I created Crux Society, an open enrollment leadership development community for leaders who know the importance of growing holistically and authentically through shared outdoor adventure. We live our values to explore, connect, and excel in every part of the process. Our next available Crux Adventure is a special edition Women's Leadership Summit, June 12 through 14. Abigail is assembled a rock star team of women to guide your group up San Jacinto offer leadership coaching, outdoor instruction, and incredible authentic conversations like this one over the whole weekend. Don't miss it. And of course, we welcome and encourage women to join our regularly scheduled adventures where we are proud to highlight a 50-50 split on gender thus far. We sincerely appreciate you taking the time to engage with us on this tough conversation, and we look forward to seeing you outside and answering questions. For webinar listeners here too, we do want to offer you a 20% off code. You'll see that down below. The Women Lead 2020 will get you 20% off our Crux Adventure either in June or July. So we do hope to see you out there.
Well, Abigail and Knight, this has been really fascinating. We do have a number of questions that have come in, as you can imagine. And I, I really feel like uh, between the two of you, you probably hit the nail on the head for every um, bias I ever encountered in business, uh, for the bias I hear about from other women and so forth. So um, one of the, the questions that came in midway through was, what do you do on these adventures that you lead? What, if you could maybe give us a, an insight into how do you address some of these leadership disparities that you've highlighted? What does that look like when you're out in an adventure with, with people? Well, for example, we just had an executive retreat in Joshua Tree this past weekend, and we take moments of like decision making. And while we're on a hike, we let the group to a certain extent decide where we're going to go next. And so we can use a pause there. And before that, we've looked at decision making styles and break down what we see happening in real time so people can observe what's happening, ask questions, and we can call out the biases that we see happening and then move forward as a group how we want to based on designating a leader and moving forward. But it's really that calling out in real time facilitation that gets us to work with the outdoor adventure as the material, as the context for all of the leadership frameworks and research that we present. So it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. So it, it sounds like um, that you're modeling for the people that are on this journey with you, what you want to see. Um, and so if you're calling this out, is that what you would also advise women to do when they're, they're in a meeting or they're at work and they're being discounted or they're being um, shut to the side, you know, in favor of, of the men in the room. What kind of, of tactical advice do you give them? It's a great question, Patty. I think, unfortunately, the reality is men, including myself, you can ask Abigail, get really defensive uh, when we talk about this stuff, right? If you call out, call me out in a meeting, I immediately get defensive. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I hope, you know, a, a couple hours or a day later, I come back with my tail talked and say, I'm sorry, I feel like a terrible human being. And most men, I think, feel like that, especially younger generations who've grown up in a, a more equal society. Uh, so that's why we really, like, hopefully men can listen to that and stop being defensive. But if in the workplace, we can create structures and expected conversations where it's not just springing something that, that's going to make a man feel defensive and then immediately derail the conversation. But, you know, every Tuesday at noon, we have a discussion about this and it's a time where people come disarmed, ready to listen to other people and maybe even get some institutional skills around active listening and, and paraphrasing and supporting each other. Abigail does some improv work and that's, you know, building on each other's thoughts instead of tearing them down. And that's a, a super critical skill for this. So I think one is teaching men to stop being so defensive. Uh, good luck. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Two, to putting structure around it so that men can expect to be challenged and, and maybe be ready for it. Our, our fragile egos might need that. So here's a, a question that um, one of our attendees posed. And she said, I am typically the only woman in the room in a business meeting. Uh, I work in tech. What do I do when I'm the only one around the table and it's, it's a boys club, basically? I would suggest finding a, an ally within that group and talking to them after a meeting and explaining what is going on and what that what you're observing and asking them to to highlight your ideas to reinforce what you're saying and to become that that partner that advocate in the room for you so that you don't feel alone and you have somebody a lot of times there's 
multiple people who see what's going on and they just don't know how to help. And so if you get one person in the room at least who's on your team and actively playing that role, then typically barriers are broken down and the space opens up a bit where um, there's more sort of voice to that woman and and you can feel supported in that way. Great, yeah. Um, say a little bit more about um, allies, you know, because that, that was in the subtitle um, of your webinar here. What are, what are other ways that women can develop allies? And, and actually, um, to get back to the defensiveness thing, to not feel defensive about needing an ally in the workplace. That's a great question. I would say first, like we all need allies. It's not a women specific thing. Any younger person working their way through the ranks in an organization needs mentors and allies and people to support in a network. And, you know, my heart goes out to women in particular who are the only one in a men's group. My, my wife was a Marine for 10 years and you know, she dealt with that there and now she's in orthopedic surgery and she deals with that there. And I see it all the time. Um, but we mentioned the book, Athena Rising, and, and I worked with the authors a little bit um, when I was teaching at the Naval Academy and they're, they're great. And they did a lot of work studying like how, how do, how should women get mentors or allies and what should that look like? And, and so I, I really recommend reading that book. It's kind of tailored toward men and, and some of it's tongue in cheek and they kind of you know, hit men over the head in a way that two men can, which is great. And, and tell us, you know, stop. I'm trying to not say uh, curse words here, but stop being the way that you're being. Um, and, and having those allies can really help out. So looking for people who, and they name a lot of these like biases that come from society, societal artifacts where you have like the father, daughter, the the champion and the maiden in distress, like those are not the people that you want. You want people who really genuinely want to help and see the value in helping. Women bring so much to the table. And if, you know, a man is mentoring some women, just like mentoring other fast uh, rising stars, fast performers, uh, there's a lot of benefit for the mentor as well. Yeah, that's excellent. And, and you mentioned um, earlier in the webinar about um, the financial ROI of including women in leadership in an organization or on a corporate board and so forth. Why do you think that there is such a financial impact when we open up the doors and, and increase membership in these groups? A lot of it is, there's different dynamics and it's um, interesting to break it down, but the there's a key part about women in decision making around being more risk averse, which tends to benefit the sustainability of an organization. And on a person to person level, what we know about engagement, especially with millennials, is that they want that community. They want people and leaders who see them and are invested in their whole selves and bringing being able to bring that whole self to work so women leaders tend to create this engagement this excitement this energy and momentum that is fuel for the culture and really bonds together the fabric of a company in a way where men tend to not be as apt to do Patty, I'm, I'm looking at our stack of stones and the word that keeps coming up is balance. Mm. We're not saying that men are bad. It's fascinating to me that when we're stressed out, like 80% of the time, we take the riskier option. This is a study that's quoted in How Women Decide, another great book. And that's not bad. If you don't take the risky option quite often as a business, you'll fail. And at the same time, having a team that's balanced and some people, I, I wouldn't even say women are risk averse. Uh, they're just more tempered and pragmatic about risk and they're not wired to automatically take the risky option. So if you have a conversation where a man's like, let's take the risky option. A woman's like, hold on a second. Let's look at that. You probably have the best possible outcome. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Um, up here in the San Francisco Bay area, of course, we're um, inundated with all of the tech giants, you know, and so forth. And I remember uh, driving down the freeway and seeing a big 
billboard that Facebook had taken out, you know, with their new motto, um, move fast and break things. And inside I just went, oh, good Lord, what, yeah. what a way to screw up. You know, and I, I was trying to imagine the marketing meeting and how many women were sitting around the table when they said that, you know, or came up with that. Hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. So here's a, a question that came in also um, asking you about uh, care and leadership and spe specifically if you're ever hired by HR to actually sit in on a company and what's going on in a project and and so that you can maybe observe in real time um, what's going on and call out some of the breakdowns we haven't done that specific work yet but we are definitely open to talking about it and we've done other consulting work so it would be similar in that way and very open to to talk about what that could look like for sure yeah, Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> you got uh, certified through Georgetown for coaching, and part of that was team coaching. So there's a, a body of work around that of not just consulting, but real time calling stuff out, which could be really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes when you when you see it in in real time, um, we don't know what we're doing. We're not always, you know, very self aware of of what's going on in. Um, in our in our interactions we just get so so into it and so busy and we're responding or actually we're reacting more than responding you know and, and are not as self-aware as we should be mm -hmm. you know one of the biases that you mentioned abigail was the success likeability penalty mm -hmm. and i was just so you know this comes up all the time every time um, a woman you know, has the audacity to try to break through some sort of barrier that has not been broken through before, you know, then for some reason, this likability thing comes up all the time. And, you know, we heard it during the um, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump uh, campaign in 2016. And then as all of these women began entering the presidential primary this year, well, is she likable? Well, is she electable? Well, is she likable? And you know, I don't know, I can't recall, I may be wrong. I don't know that I ever heard that about any of the men that were jumping into the fray. So why is this, why is this likability thing such a bias against women? That's, that's a really interesting question. It's interesting, Patty, because women would say the same thing, right? Like they'd say, well, is Hillary likable? often it's ingrained in our society yeah i'm gonna get a little risque here um one of my old bosses who actually will be on women lead radio march 30th with me i'm really excited about that i was i was asking her i was in this process of trying to figure out women in leadership and women specific events and and i was asking her about what she thought about it and she made the point that men never learn how to look at women as colleagues and equals. We go through high school and college is hormone ridden and looking at women either as that beautiful scary person that I don't want to talk to because I'm scared or a sexual type of conquest. And there's never, no one sits down with us and says, look, this is a colleague and she can be successful and her success will drive success in your organization. And I think that's so important and that's where having allies and mentors and these tough conversations, uh, that's why our next topic for the Campfire Dialogue is sex and leadership for, for this very conversation is how do we break through that and help men and society view women as colleagues and not uh, as scary or sexual objects. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about um, the Campfire Conversation? I love the title. So. What, what does that actually look like? How do you do that? It's going to be similar to this conversation around the content that we'll dissect, but we will set ground rules and create a space where people can have dialogue both. We'll start out the conversation as a whole group and going around and then we'll break off into small groups at some point and have opportunities to share in partnerships. So, changing the dynamics of the group and sort of 
decomposing the parts of this conversation and then coming back together as a big part. But really it's that groundwork that we lay in the beginning that's so crucial that we will model here and hopefully give people the tools and skills to take back to their workplace. Um, I led a discussion group for a year and a half called Mindful Think Tank. And it was the same sort of format of different perspectives, sitting down at a table and learning to have healthy dialogue. And that was such a beneficial forum for everyone involved. And so recreating that with this very specific sort of topic on gender and leadership for this first one is going to be powerful, we, we know. Wow, it sounds, sounds excellent, sounds wonderful. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? We, we had a lot of questions that came in. So this, uh, you struck a nerve. Obviously, this is a conversation that needs to be had and needs to be had again and again and again. Because like you said, night bias does not, you don't just shine a light on it and bam, there it is, it's gone. It's something that's deeply embedded in us and we have to call it out as over and over and as often as necessary. So anything else that you guys would like to add um, before we wrap up for the day, wrap up our time together? Well, I just want to say that our lines are open and we would definitely if you want to <laughs> contact us and continue the conversation with either of us. You can reach us, reach us at abigail at karenleadership.com and knight at karenleadership.com and we both love coffee and love to talk especially about this so definitely feel free to reach out if you're in the san diego area or if, you know online virtually seems to be the way these days so we are definitely happy to share and grow and learn from all of you and continue the conversation yeah it does uh, thank goodness for technology and for virtual get-togethers because the learning doesn't have to stop and and our get-togethers don't have to stop so I want to thank you again, um, Knight Campbell and Abigail Jones of Karen Leadership Strategies for being our thought leaders today. I thought this was fascinating and clearly our, our other listeners did as well. Uh, and to all of our attendees today who are online or those that will be listening to this in the replays later on, thank you for joining us and supporting us. And we will be back again soon with our next Women Lead webinar series on how you can lead, achieve, and succeed as a female leader in business. Thank you again for joining us and thank you again, Abigail and Knight. Thank you. Thank you.